Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure coming to you from Waikiki Beach. It's that time of year when the whales are heading uh, heading home with their with their babies and uh, the change of the season, which what it means here in, in Waikiki is that the big north swells of the winter are passing and the windows of those big hurricanes or those big storms uh, that generate good surf for us are swinging to the south. And so Waikiki is going to start lighting up. The, the 18 different uh, reefs that we hear in Waikiki are going to start lighting up. So every here in Waikiki is, is stoked and getting ready for the summer swells. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm so stoked to have our guest today, Dr. Jim Papandrea. He's an a expert on the early church fathers. We're going to be talking about his new book about how the early church worshipped which is uh, a life-changing uh, experience just to talk about that. He's the kind of guy, when he looks at one of those icons that all look alike, he knows what they stand for. So he's pretty smart. But before we get started, I want to let you guys know my new book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, based on Dr. Jim Papandrea's life, is uh, <laughs> has, has really been successful. It's been hitting the top five in book Christian books for men. And I've been reading uh, excerpts from from the book to start off each show. But I wanted to say, um, you know, the, the thing about the, the cowboy is he was usually a man of few words, but when he said something, he meant it. And so, uh, hey, uh, and so um, th my thought came to me today uh, about how we, how we speak to ourselves. You know, before Jesus became incarnate and we called him Jesus, he was the son of God. He was the second person of the Trinity. He was and always will be the, the Sophia. He always will be the word, as John said, in the beginning was the word. And I want to talk to you about how you speak to your own, to yourself, what words you use in your everyday life. Do you let uh, frustration and complaints be uttered from your mouth? My mom and dad uh, taught us when I was in high school, we weren't allowed to speak like that. Any negative uh, or complaining was just plain not allowed. If you had a serious conversation, you needed to have that was different. But to speak negatively, they taught me, is like planting seeds in your in your mind that are going to bear fruit. Have you ever been around people that are, are kind of energy takers instead of energy givers? Those are the kind of people that you hear complaining. Uh, every, nothing ever seems to go right for them, and there's always drama in their life. Well, no wonder they're bringing that on themselves by the way they speak. They're using this powerful gift of God, our words, and, and, proclaim, and saying negative things. And your mind begins to reap a harvest of those negative things, and you begin to, and you begin to, um, you begin to uh, live out like self-fulfilling prophecies. Like if you're golfing and you go, oh, oh, this is the hardest hole on the golf course. I never get this right. You're probably pretty much never going to get it right if you keep saying that. So I'm just challenging you. You're made in the Imago Dei. You're made in the image of God. Let your words uh, speak, uh, be something that God finds uh, pleasure in. As Paul said, whatever is good, whatever is excellent, whatever is perfect, you know, think on these things. Um, it's not what comes, you know, it goes into the mouth that uh, defiles a man, but what comes out. Let your speech, let every word you say be something that God can find pleasure in. And it'll it'll reap a harvest in your life. And those people that always have this drama in life, if they would start saying things like, I, uh, by thee I can leap a rock, by thee I can leap a wall, by thee I can crush, a, I can bend a bow of bronze, lead me to the rock too high to climb and I will climb it. Uh, not by might, not by uh, strength, but by by my spirit, says the Lord. You know, um, those who are weak are strong. We're strong because of Jesus. Begin to begin to hang on in faith, because right now, everybody, you hear everybody all the time worrying about what's coming, how everything is going wrong, how what's wrong with the church, what's wrong with society. Dude, look at your own life and just see how you can plant and harvest and make something good. Okay, enough of my preaching. We have a guest today, and uh, Dr. Kimo Papandrea. That's his Hawaiian name, Kimo. He probably doesn't know that. He's, I didn't know he, 
he, he's known as Dr. James Papandrea. That means he's a smart, but his friends still call him Jim. He's a PhD in the, what I want to get my, my master's degree. And I've been training a little bit at Steubenville is history and theology of the early Christian church. He, he is a, he loves to uh, study uh, the history of the Roman empire. Uh, there's a, there's a meme that's out now. That's that ask, people are out asking, interviewing people, interviewing men. By the way, how many times a week do you think about the Roman Empire? And they go, I think about it all the time. And uh, I think that's the nature of a real man is wanting to, to there, there was a certain virtue that we saw. And that's saying everything was right there, but there was a certain virtue uh, that was going on there when, the, when, when in, in the time of Christendom, when Western civilization, the Holy Roman Catholic Church and Rome itself uh, represented something powerful and strong. So Dr. Jim Papandrea, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Wow, it's great to be uh, with you. I'm I'm here in the continental version of of Hawaii, which we call Florida. But where uh, are you? Where are you I in am, Florida? I'm in Fort Myers, Florida. That's where I live. And, oh, we love Fort Myers. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's great to be on the show. I, I appreciate you uh, inviting me. This is great. Well, two two of my sons live directly on the on the east coast from where you are. They're in they're in Melbourne Beach oh, area. Okay. So we were just in your area in February. We spoke at the Tampa event, and then we went down to. To, isn't Fort Myers on the East Coast? I mean, on the West Coast? Yeah, yeah, Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, we went down to Naples and that area. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. right here. You drove right past my house. Yeah, well, I thought I heard you uh, praying deeply, resonating, <laughs> speaking Greek, probably in Greek, you know? Yeah, so, no, not I mean, me, Italian. <laughs> well, I'm like, oh, really? Oh, how cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Are you one of those people that when you get together as a family, it's almost like, waterboarding they bring so much food you just you, you can't you just have to almost like you can't you have to push them away you have to protect yourself from the onslaught of the food yeah we do eat well okay well i'm gonna i'm going to um sorry i just got an interruption here so you know what um i have a friend who's a priest who was a wonderful um assembly of god uh youth uh i was went to was went to assembly of god seminary and because the Assembly of God prays in tongues and, and has some of those early charismatic gifts, it, they felt that this is how the early church worshipped. I admit some of that part of that is true. And so the senior pastor there one summer said, uh, why don't you do a special Bible study this summer on how the early church worshipped? Yeah. And by the time he finished his study, he became Catholic. Yep. That's happen. how dramatic it is. And you're a revert. So can you tell us, first of all, your reversion story? Well, sure. It's um, it's not super uh, unique or surprising. I, um, I became convinced through. I actually went to a Protestant seminary, got my uh, my MDiv, and uh, just you know really fell in love with the early church and church history, and and became convinced that, um, you know, it was it, it's important what the early Christians believed and what the church fathers taught because of their proximity in time to, you know, the origins of the church, to Jesus and the apostles. So when I went back for my PhD, I decided, well, I should study this original church um, because I had come up in the Protestant world with, with the myth that the Protestant Reformation was all about getting back to some original pristine version of Christianity before the Catholics wrecked it by adding things. And, um, and so I thought, well, I, I should really study what this, original version of Christianity is. And in the process of getting my PhD in that, I discovered a couple of things. Like, for example, there is no such thing as pre-Catholic Christianity, right? There is no... <laughs> right, uh, very right, well said. Right, yeah. so, so the Protestant Reformation was not getting back to a pristine version of Christianity. The Protestant Reformation was, in, in among other things, stripping away uh, aspects of Christianity that had been part of our faith from the beginning. Um, and so when you study the beginning, you realize this and you, and you say things to yourself like, oh my gosh, um, hmm. the intercession of the saints was there from the beginning. Holy cow, people made the sign of the cross from the beginning, you know, and, 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 and they baptized, I mean, it says, even in the Bible, it says they baptized the whole household. Sure, of course, of course. You know, um, although I was in Protestant denominations that did infant baptism, so so that mm -hmm. wasn't my issue per se. But of course, mm -hmm. I came to find out that 
Um, this this is what you know. The the, the early church was the Catholic Church, um, mm-hmm. At, mm-hmm. at least at least closer to the Catholic Church than anything else out there. And so by the time I had finished my doctorate, I knew that I had to come back to the Catholic <laughs> Church of my Italian heritage. You know, well, uh, what a mess you made of your life, man. Wait, <laughs> wait, uh, Doctor Doctor Chemo, Doctor James um, Papandrea. Where can people find you? And then we'll get back when we really dig into your new book and how the early church worshipped. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I'm not on social media and stuff. The easiest place to find me is to go look for me on YouTube. My YouTube channel is called The Original Church. And you can start there and, and go from there. Awesome. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure com- coming to you from Waikiki Beach. I want to remind everybody, go to the School of Manliness. It's schoolofmanliness.com and become a member of the Man Cave and our, and our three-year curriculum. Uh, on uh, that you as men can go through with all the all these other men that are part of the man cave but you can lead your sons through too they get their own login and you can lead them through these these this this monthly curriculum uh with video audio written self-assessments all the kind of stuff so go to schoolmanliness.com this is the bear wasnick adventure we'll be right back schoolofmanliness.com is a place for men of grit and grace to join together to inspire, to encourage, and to challenge each other to grow in manly virtue. Members receive morning man meditations, a monthly curriculum that is rich with audio, video, and written content, and a trail guide to help you map out your new trajectory. Many of our members lead their sons through this same curriculum. Your membership gives you access to both the Man Cave, which is our non-Facebook type community, and the School of Manliness at schoolofmanliness.com. Become a member at schoolofmanliness.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. This is a warning. The Bear Wozniak Adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is your host, Bear Wozniak. I want to let everybody know Cindy and I are up to no good. When we filmed our last season of Long Ride Home, we did 11 episodes right here in Hawaii. And it used to be just me and all the knuckle draggers riding our motorcycles across the United States. But when we came to Hawaii, Cindy started showing up in some of the episodes. And so we'd be getting letters, especially from the mama bears. We want more Cindy. We want more Cindy. So uh, if you're interested, go to spiritofadventuretv.com or go to the Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure YouTube channel, but we are putting together a show now, Cindy and I, YouTube-based show of our fun in the sun in, in Hawaii and the islands where we live here and sailing on our boat, Spirit of Adventure in the Caribbean. And we want to invite you, you're going to have fun with this. You're going to see that you're going to enjoy the beauty and the fun of, of the islands, but then we're going to be uh, uh, speaking truth, uh, Catholic truth, and we're going to speak, uh, we're going to inspire. So it's a great, uh, everything we do, whether it's Long Ride Home, the motorcycle show, or or uh, or this show Cindy and I are doing, most everything we do is kind of a thing where we kind of grab people's attention, kind of with a little bit of something entertaining, and then we give them the truth. So uh, so check it out, uh, spiritadventuretv.com with, and, uh, is the website, and Cindy and I are leaving in just a few days to go to uh, the Virgin Islands and do the first uh, five weeks of filming. Uh, we have with us our guest, Dr. 
Jim Papandrea. You know what, uh, Jim? The reason why I came back to the church, my dad was a deacon, and he sent me a book by Scott Hahn, of course, on the Mass. But then he sent me um, the book Crossing the Tiber, and I discovered the early church fathers. Uh-huh. And I, by the time I was done with that book, I realized that the primitive church was a Catholic church, and I was beside myself because I hadn't left the Lord. In fact, in some ways, the Catholic church had left me because I was hungry, wanted to be fed, and there was no one there to, I didn't know. Right. Can right. you tell me what an early church father is? Because is, 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 when I share with people, sometimes I think, well, what is that, the book of Enoch or all these weird apocryphal books? Can you differentiate that and clarify who the early church fathers were? Then we're going to get into their your book. Right, right. Yeah. So the the uh, we, we call them the church fathers, though there are a few church mothers too, but they're mostly men. Um, and these are the early theologians and bishops of the Christian church. So you have the New Testament, which is the earliest documents of Christianity, right? Written by the apostles. And uh, those were written within the first century. Um, although there are a couple of the first uh, documents outside of the New Testament that we call the documents of the church fathers, a couple of those were written within the first century too. You have a thing by Bishop Clement of Rome. We just call it First mm-hmm. Clement. Um, you got a thing called the DDK, which is the first oh. church order manual, and then it goes from there. And so the the first bishops of the church were all the the disciples and then successors of the apostles, and um, and they start writing things. And we still have, and we have access to, even translated into English, many of these writings um, from the second century, third century, fourth century, and on and on. And, um, you know, the ones that have stood the test of time, obviously, the ones that are by bishops and and other, uh, you know, um, approved theologians, these came to literally define what Christianity is because these outline, these documents outline the church's authoritative and accepted in, in, um, interpretations of the New Testament and the Old and of the person of Jesus Christ himself, right? So Jesus asked the big question, who do you say that I am? And how you answer that question makes all mm. the difference. Well, you know, um, not only do we have the scriptures in the New Testament, but we have the earliest interpretations of the of the scriptures to guide us as we read it, and that's the church fathers. It's, it's why, a don't just, why don't you just make it simple and just say, these are the guys that look like ZZ Top? Many of them do. Yeah. <laughs> they have right. long, long, long beards. Well, you know, as a theologian, you know, I, I remember when, I don't know if you know this, there's, a, there's an ancient church tradition about when Jesus appeared to some of the early theologians. And he said, who do you say that I am? And one of them said that you are the eschala- eschatological uh, ground of our being. <laughs> and another one said, you're the charismatic utterance of God. And Jesus said, What? Yeah, <laughs> no, but, but but you can see behind me, I have those books. I, you know what? You know what those books are behind me. Yeah, right. I have right. the commentaries oh, yeah. and the writings. Yeah, I oh, I get look at my goosebumps, man. I love the oh, love the writings of the early church fathers. I just pray, Lord, give me time to read more. Yeah. Okay, so let's get into it. Was the primitive church a Catholic church? Yeah, yeah, and and you know this is this is the thing though. Like you mentioned earlier. Oh, you know, let's do a study on how the early church worshipped. Um, and um, I have seen Protestants try to do this by saying, well, you know, we have this doctrine of sola scriptura, so we're just only going to look in the Bible, and we're going to look at the New Testament and try to figure out how the early Christians... Well, isn't, isn't sola worshiped. scriptura in the Bible? Yeah, <laughs> well, that's, that's the irony, isn't it? Because <laughs> <laughs> sola scriptura is as a doctrine, self-contradictory, right? It claims, you know, Bible alone, and yet the Bible doesn't teach the doctrine of Bible alone. So, mm. uh, the, you know, the whole thing collapses in on itself under its own weight. But mm. but the problem is, is if you if you try to use that doctrine of, of Scripture alone, um, well, let me say it this way. All heresy is the attempt to interpret Scripture apart from the tradition and apart from the church, right? Can you say, so, say that one more time? That is so profound. 
All heresy is the attempt to interpret Scripture apart from the tradition and apart from the church. So Scripture alone will always lead to heresy. It, because it, people it, extract, they extract uh, slices and don't yeah. take it all in context, and they choose what they're going to take literally and what they're not. For example, when Jesus said, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you can have no part of me. They go, well, Jesus didn't mean that literally. Well, then yeah. why did thousands and thousands of followers depart from him? You know, And then they'll say, well, when Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my church, they weren't talking about Peter. They were talking about his statement of faith. You know, so what do you, so, so you, you pick and you choose, um, but, but the, the, the tradition, the solid teach, where do we see the word tradition is, is the word tradition ever mentioned in the Bible? Well, you know, that's an interesting point because it actually is. Um, but the, you know, the problem is, is that in Greek, in the new Testament, hmm. uh, the, the same Greek word can be translated tradition, or it can be translated teaching which right there tells you that the tradition of the church is the teaching of the church. Amen. But what ends up happening is if you're not careful, you'll end up with one of these, this Bibles that are translated in the Protestant world. And they will, they will, without telling you what they're doing, mm -hmm. they'll sometimes translate that word tradition when it suits their purpose. And then other times not. So anytime St. Paul, for example, talks about tradition in a positive sense, they're going to take that word and translate it as teaching instead, because they don't mm -hmm. want anything positive said about tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Because again, that wouldn't support their doctrine of sola scriptura. So, mm -hmm. um, so you have you do have to be careful of what translation you're using, mm -hmm. um, you know. And 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 but what ends up happening is is that if you say, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to look at only the New Testament to figure out how the early Christians prayed and or worshiped um it's not going to work because because it, the new testament doesn't really tell you much about that at all mm -hmm. which is surprising mm -hmm. but it doesn't and so you have to go to the church fathers to see you know how how they did it and and how they read the new testament and where mm -hmm. did they how did they know the difference between what to take literally and, and not and all of that you you, mm -hmm. you need we need them to know how to read the mm -hmm. new testament that's the bottom line so um, it's beautiful, uh, so beautiful. You know, Jesus, you know, Jesus, I think the word is tekton. I don't know if I'm saying it quite right, but when, when, he, when we know that people say Jesus was a carpenter, no, he was a builder. Though tekton means to be a builder. And if you've yeah, ever right. been to Israel, you've been to Israel, I've never seen any, any building made out of wood. I think the prime minister's house is, but things are made pretty much out of stone there. Uh, or there are some Bedouins out there with, with, with tents and aluminum type huts and stuff, but Jesus was a builder, but do we know one thing that he built? Yes, only one. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And he gave us Peter as the prime minister, and he gave us, you know, right now, all of the all of us, some we get all worried about oh, what's happening to the Catholic Church. Woe is me. Hey, Jesus knows what he's doing. And the Holy Ghost hasn't abandoned the church. The Holy the Holy Spirit is large and in charge. Yeah, no, that's right. In fact, you know, a, a, another part of that whole Protestant myth is that, is that you know, there's some point along the way when the church went off the rails, and they in the the Reformation had to bring it back. But but that's got to be a myth because if that were true, then Jesus must have stopped keeping his promise at some point because Jesus himself promised the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And you know, Amen. I mean, if the church goes off the rails to that extent, then then hell has won, and that has not mm. happened. You know. And and by the way, gates don't attack people. We're meant to attack the gates. We're talking with Dr. Jim Papandrea. Doesn't that just sound right? Sounds sounds like a smart guy. This is Bear Wozniak. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. Announcing Spirit Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. So many people, especially you mama bears, tell us we want more of Bear and Cindy together. Well, we're happy to announce our website, spiritofadventuretv.com, as well as our YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure, where you can watch Spirit of Adventure TV with Bear and Cindy. Join us where we live in the Hawaiian Islands or where we sail our boat, the Spirit of Adventure, in the Caribbean. Experience both adventure and serenity with us. 
as we share our life together, as well as the joy and the wisdom of our faith. Go to spiritofadventuretv.com to find out more and subscribe on YouTube to Bear Wozniak Spirit of Adventure. And join us, Spirit of Adventure, with Bear and Cindy. Here is a YouTube video short, which is based on an excerpt from my newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? At times I've been asked by men, I know I need to get in better shape, but where do I get the motivation? Dude, just look at your wife and children. Do you want to be actively involved in their lives and take care of them, or do you want them to have to end up taking care of you? Here's the real facts. You're either getting stronger or weaker physically. There's no standing still. And the fact is, you grow in virtue as you discipline your body. God has a mission for you. Be ready, be fit for that challenge. Buy 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? at schoolofmanliness.com or wherever books are sold. Mama Bears, get these books into the hands of your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com and subscribe to our weekly email to receive video YouTube links of the Bear Wozniak radio show, as well as the Spirit of Adventure with Bear and Cindy TV show, which, by the way, is filmed in the tropics as well as our manly evangelistic YouTube shorts. Go to schoolofmanliness.com. Be the kind of man that when he gets out of bed in the morning, the devil says, oh no, he's up. Go to deepadventure.com and invite Bear to speak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm, I'm talking to someone who gets to do what God designed him to do. You know, we all have our personal talents, our personal calling. This guy, I'm so jealous of him. I'm looking at Jim. He's got icons in the background. He's probably, I, I bet you can actually smell the fragrance of books surrounding you, which is a great, my, one of my favorite fragrances, more than plumerias and tuberose. Uh, and your book, about how the early church worshiped. How did the early church worship? Well, you know, there's a couple of things that um, you have to understand. And, and you know, worship, when we talk about worship, um, we're really talking about the mass. And, mm. you know, the, the early church, if you read the earliest documents that describe what early Christians did in worship, if you if you've never read this, um, you you know people uh, are very surprised that it sounds almost exactly like what we still do in liturgy. That's the conversion moment I had when I read right. uh, Justin Martyr Justin when he Martyr. wrote about the the Epiclesis. I go, wait a minute, I that's what I hear in Mass almost word for word every day. Yeah, you know, right, right at that moment and, of consecration. And it's amazing because Justin Martyr was actually not even trying to write. Uh, like a, a church order manual with, you know, here's your order of worship. He was just describing to pagans what Christians do in worship. And yet it comes out almost exactly like, you know, what we still experience in the mass. And well, he, so, he, yeah, he was defending the church to the, to the emperor. Yeah. Saying, look, I know you think we're, we we're cannibals because it is said that we consume someone called Christus or something. That's how strongly people believed it was the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus that people thought there, he was defending that. No, 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 yeah. we're not cannibals. And that yeah. was what about what, what year was that? 150 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, right, right about the middle of the second century. So about 150, uh, he writes his first apology, and it's in that document. And uh, you know, he just describes what Christians do when they gather. And you know, it especially, you know, people who read that as Protestants. And I, again, like I said, I've mm. seen Protestants try and try and recreate. Um, like a an early Christian order of worship from the New Testament alone, and it can't be done because there's there's just not enough information there, you know. Unless mm. you want to say, you know, at this point in the service, somebody falls out the window, you know, there's not enough information you, in the Book of Acts to do that. But you know what's you done? No, go ahead. Go well, ahead. you I'm get sorry. it from the Church Fathers. That's where you get it. Well, I was stunned at Mass the other day, uh, listening to the Scripture verse about when J Jesus was on the road to Emmaus. He had Mass. 
And yeah. he did that in the order we do it. He started out with the liturgy of the word. He right. taught them all about Old Testament and what it had to do with him. And then he sat down and he blessed the Eucharist. At the moment of the blessing, he vanished, but he didn't leave. Right. He <laughs> entered into the host. He entered into the right there at that moment. There's the mass right there. And, yeah. and then you see the early church. And the beauty of the early church, too, is you you get historical context from them, too. But I'm sorry, I get so excited. Tell me more about how what how did the early church worship? Well, here's the thing. I mean, it was really all about the Mass. Um, and uh, and so, you know, given the fact that that what we do, what we call the Mass— now, I, I'm not an expert in liturgy, so I tend to use terms like the Mass very generally, but I'm thinking, you know— the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist, like what we do for that hour, um, very much like what they did from the beginning. Um, and, and we know that from the early church documents. But of course, you know, you and I know as we're not clergy. So, um, you know, our participation in that, well, that is what it is. But then what if you ask the question, okay, but then what does private prayer look like? What does personal devotion look like in the early church? Um, and that's really what I was researching when I was working on this book. Like what, okay, we know what it's like to go to mass and and we should. And, and in the early church, it seems that as much as possible, people understood that it was the ideal, if they could, to go to mass every day, if you can, uh, or where it's offered every day. And it was, you know, there, there's a variety of situations in the early church, but Ideally, you go to Mass every day. Well, okay, but what if you don't go to Mass every day? What do you do on the days you don't go to Mass? Or or what do you do when you're at home in your private prayer life? And um, and again, you know, that is something you you can't get from the New Testament. What what did early Christians do for prayer? And you know, what we find out from the church fathers is uh, you know, a couple of things, one of which is the expectation of praying the Our Father. Now, obviously, that is in the New Testament. Jesus taught his disciples the Our Father. But this was not, as, as you know, I've heard people say back in the day, this was not just Jesus giving them an example of a typical prayer or an outline for prayer or a template for prayer. No, Jesus was dictating to them a verbatim prayer that they were expected to, to pray word for word, Every day, and by the time of the Didache, hey, which is still in the first century, three times a day. So, so the very first, um, you know, sort of realization of personal private prayer is pray the Our Father three times a day, um, and and it it grows from there, but it begins there, and um, you know, it's it's just very interesting that. Uh, you know, that, that Jesus taught this prayer. And, and one of the things we forget is Jesus taught this prayer, it seems, relatively early in his ministry with his disciples. Like, it's not it's not something he taught them on the eve of his crucifixion. Um, he taught this to them relatively early. So we have to assume they were already reciting this every day, word for word, for potentially years, a couple of years. Um with Jesus while he was on earth. Mm, think about that. So when when Matthew goes to write his gospel, and I do believe that the disciple Matthew wrote the gospel of Matthew, right? Um, some scholars don't want to admit that. It's but, pretty obvious by the way he wrote, yeah. I think. Well, sure. Um, and we could talk about that another day. But the point is, is that when Matthew sat down to write his gospel and he gets to the part where Jesus teaches the Our Father— he knows it by heart. He knows it so well. He's been saying it every day, right? And so um, so this is where personal private prayer begins in the early church. Well, you and you can see going back uh, the liturgy of the hour that we yeah. pray as Catholics or deacons and priests. And uh, I think I think a, a priest is required to. I know my dad was a yeah. deacon. He was required to. Yeah. And uh, the liturgy of the hour, that, that three times a day, in most, you know, because you love Roman history, but in, in, in any Roman town that was big enough, they had a, a bell that would ring three times a day. So it was naturally the time when, because not everybody had their smartwatch on, it was right. naturally a time 
when Christians would stop at those day, that those hours when it rang during the day or when, whenever those were, and they would and they would pray the. This was the beginning of the liturgy of the hour. They yeah, had the Psalms, and right. when the Gospels came, it was included. But this so that tradition of the liturgy of the hour. Oh, there it is. Yeah, no, you're you're right absolutely there. right. It starts with with praying the Our Father three times a day, and then you can you can track it through the church fathers. Then a little later. Somebody says, well, obviously three times a day, but you also got to do morning and night. So that's five times a day. And then, mm -hmm. you know, they just sort of keep expanding that till at one point there was eight um, hours, eight, eight prayer hours. And then that eventually got pared down to seven. But um, but yeah, that's exactly really? right. And they and then they prayed the uh, they prayed the Psalms uh, mm -hmm. based on Jewish practice. And they prayed Going back to David. Yeah, he, he, he kept the hours. He wrote the Psalms. He, he he would keep watch. He would keep his watches through the day. Right. I think. Stop yeah. Pray. I think it said he prayed three times a day as well. Exactly. Mm, interesting. Uh, or was it? Am I thinking of Daniel? There's a passage where Daniel prays three times a day also. And, and, and David said, "You know, I keep the watch of the night." By the way, he's drinking out of a cup with Sophia on it because he's a Sophia, Sophia author. Press. Yeah. Do you understand that Sophia's never given me a coffee mug, and I'm there? I'm. They have three of my books. Uh, I, I'm sorry about that. Well, I have, I have deep roots of bitterness about that. I don't anyway. remember when I got this, but uh, it is one you of my. You just keep moments. flashing it in front of me with the word Sophia every ten minutes. I, I we're didn't talking to uh, <laughs> incite envy or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, envy, Aquinas said, it's the worst of all sins uh, because your envy means you. You what does envy mean? It means that you wish someone didn't have something, not that you wish you had it. So I think I'm more, I'm jealous. I'm jealous because okay. I wish I had that. All right. We're talking right. to Dr. James Papandrea. Where can they find you? Uh, we'll, we'll take a break here in a moment. We'll be right back. But where can people find you? Yeah. Easiest place is to look for me on YouTube. My YouTube channel is called The Original Church. It's a great, it's a great channel. I've watched some of it. And what is the name of the book? The book is called Praying Like the Early Church, Seven Insights from the Church Fathers to Help You Connect with God. I've, I've often wondered what that moment was like when Jesus died and he ascended and that first moment of communion with Jesus, when Peter was like, Jesus, are you there? You know, cause you know what I mean? And I think about Mary also uh, communing with Jesus in that precious way. We're talking with Dr. Jim Papandrea. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. People love our EWTN TV show, Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak. Thanks to you, the show has won four different Tally Awards. And now, instead of waiting each week for the next episode to air, you can actually binge watch our show and even share it with your friends when you go to deepadventure.com and join the Mama Bears or the Man Cave. Along with all the other benefits, you get total access to all the seasons of our aired episodes, plus instant access to episodes that won't even air for several months. Long Ride Home with Bear Wastick, a great way to communicate the gospel in a gritty enough way that even tough men will stop and watch at deepadventure.com. Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. Here is a YouTube video short, which is based on an excerpt from my newest book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? The world needs a man who will keep his word. You know, don't easily trust a man again who has broken his word to you. But if you give him a second chance, encourage him to be truthful and a man of his word and inspect what you expect. As John Wayne once said, every man deserves a second chance, but keep a strong eye on him. The world needs men right now to be cowboys, to be a man who keeps his word. In fact, a man who is a man of the word, a man who keeps his word and knows God's word. My newest book, 
12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone, has hit the top five in Christian books for a good reason. It's because men are searching for traction and a trail guide to live out the unique calling and the gifts that they were born with, that each man individually is factory loaded with by God. Paul said, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, do all things in love. Finally, here is a book that talks with men the way men talk with each other. Just plain old straight shoot. By the way, Mama Bears, this is your chance to get this message to your men. Go to schoolofmanliness.com or anywhere books are sold. 12 Rules for Manliness. Where have all the cowboys gone? Are you still listening? I thought we warned you to change to an easy listening station. Well, you asked for it. Here is more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I want to tell everybody about this book, 12 Rules for Manliness, Where Have All the Cowboys Gone? It's written in a way that any man would want to read it. Um, when people do read it, you know, a lot of men don't like to read, but I just tell them, read the first chapter. And then uh, people have said they've read it through more than three times um, and reading this book with their sons. Women love the book too, because it really, especially uh, a woman who has a son, uh, help, helps you understand how you want to prepare that help him along his road, helps you understand your man, helps young women understand what kind of man they want. But the 12 rules for manliness, it's got to number five in books for Christian men. It talks to men the way, you know, the way we talk with each other. It's gritty. It's real. There's some kind of things there that you may not, you know, that just, you wouldn't normally just talk about on a radio show. Uh, but uh, it's grit and grace, man. Men were made out of mud. And it's helping you get back to that calling that God has for your life. Uh, it could have been based on the on the life of the man who's with us today, Dr. Jim Papandrea, uh, who is a, an author of the newest book on on how the early church worshipped, and uh, an expert in the early church fathers and loves Roman history. What's the title of the book? The book again, Jim. Uh, the book is called "Praying Like the Early Church: Seven Insights from the Church Fathers to Help You Connect with God." Okay, well, what are those seven insights? You got you okay. got 10 minutes to explain the whole book. All right, here we go. Uh, well, so the first chapter is the most important prayer. And uh, spoiler alert, the most important prayer is the one that lay people don't actually get to pray with their own voices, which is the Eucharistic prayer. So again, oh. the priority of the Eucharist, of the Mass, right? Praise God. Uh, the second chapter is the most powerful prayer. The most powerful prayer is uh, actually, I mean, maybe this is debatable, but I'm saying it's the most powerful by word count, which is the sign of the cross. And, mm. you know, this is another myth that I believed back when I was a Protestant, which was that the early Christians didn't make the sign of the cross. Well, they absolutely did. And not only did they make the sign of the cross, but they understood it to be a prayer, a blessing, a prayer of protection. Mm etc. So I've got a chapter on the sign of the cross and even some stuff on the symbol of the cross in the early church. Another myth is that the, the Christians didn't use the cross as a symbol until after Constantine. That's not true. The cross was a symbol from the beginning, and I talk about that. Mm. The, third, the third insight is uh, called the most perfect prayer. And that mm. phrase I get from the church fathers themselves, because what they called the most perfect prayer is of course the Our Father, right? And so, so in that chapter, I go through, uh, and I uh, several of the church fathers wrote commentaries on the Our Father, where they where they mm. teach what what each line means, what mm. we're really asking for, what that prayer is all about. So I I pull all that material together and uh, what, talk what, what what's the most dangerous phrase in that in the Our Father. Well, I, I mean, think it's, I think it's the most da most dangerous prayer. I mean, as you know, I think this is probably where you're you're going. But the prayer includes a promise we make, which oh. is to forgive others, right? Mm. And so, mm. so in the context of this prayer, you know, we're saying, you know, forgive our sins as we forgive others. Oh, that and, is dangerous. So that's a very dangerous prayer. The line that I pull out is the line, "Thy will be done." 
Oh, well, sure. Yeah. And it, that's it, one of it, that's one of the mm. hardest to to mean it, right? Um yeah. because, because one of the one of the things you got to make sure you don't do is treat prayer as though you're giving God advice, right? <laughs> which which this this is the human temptation, right? I'm going to I'm going to pray now. So now God listen to me while I tell you how to fix all my problems, right? This is, <laughs> we're all tempted to do that, right? But no, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is not giving God advice. It's it's you know the thy thy will be done is a dangerous prayer because it's saying God come and invade earth. Mm. Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a lightning bolt that knocks Satan out of the sky. It's Jesus saying, "Thy will be done," and going to the cross. Also. Well, how about the line? How about the line, "Thy kingdom come"? I mean, yeah, that that's a know, treasonous statement. In a sense, what you're saying when you pray that is, you know, like the old Marana thought, "Jesus, come mm. back soon." You're you're praying for the second coming, and I don't know about you, but I mean. I'm kind of enjoying my life. So there's a part of me that's like, you know, Jesus, come back when I'm old. <laughs> I, when, I, when I was young, I thought Jesus was coming back within a few years. And I, said, I just want to get married first. And now, oh, there's a good swell. Just wait a little while. But, but yeah. it, that's true. But it was also what God Jesus crucified because yeah. I thought he, they, they said he proclaimed sure. himself to be the king of the Jews. So that's a, I think to me, that, that prayer is the most dangerous prayer of all. It's dangerous to us personally. We may be martyred because we say thy will be done, but it's an invasion also. Yeah, no doubt. Okay, I got carried away. Give us more of the, the That's prayers. all right. Okay, so insight number four, and this was surprising even to me when I did the, the research because, again, I came up in a world where people talk about different types of prayer. There's there's prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of petition and prayers of confession. And you even have those, you, you get those little acronyms like ACTS, you know, adoration, confession, thanksgiving. Well, guess what? The early Christians were having none of that. They did not worry about different kinds of prayer. They said every prayer should be a prayer of thanksgiving. So even mm. that is not a specific kind of prayer. Um, they did not worry about types of prayer based on what you're asking for, because at the end of the day, prayer is ultimately not about asking for things, right? And so they really only made the distinction between prayers for yourself and prayers for someone else, intercession. And then having made that distinction, they said, you should keep your prayers for yourself to a minimum. So, um, so, so prayer is focused on intercession. And, um, you know, uh, it, it's very interesting because going to mass, I always used to think, okay, the, the, you know, the person up there is asking for prayers for these people whose names are being mentioned, but they're not telling us what's wrong with them or what their situation is. And I guess that's for privacy or whatever. But it turns out that the early Christians didn't do that either. They just remembered a name in prayer mm. and leave it up to God how they to help have. that person. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Right. So again, prayer is not giving God advice on how to fix things. Um, so there's, you know, don't worry about kinds of prayer, types of prayer, not, not even a thing. Um, and then I get into what does it mean to pray without ceasing? Mm. And, uh, so there's a couple aspects to that. One of which you already mentioned the, the, the development of the, of the prayer hours and what it means to have a rhythm of, of prayer in our lives and then also to build into that rhythm what what the church fathers call the two wings of prayer if you want your prayers to fly up to god saint augustine would say you need to give your prayer the two wings of what fasting and almsgiving oh right. no no yes. no yeah i, I and almsgiving yeah well actually yeah. The, i think i think the bible says that at, at, or I've read that maybe in the catechism that it's spiritual yeah. warfare when you when you fast and when you give both it's all yeah and 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 so the church fathers talk about the ways in which fasting and almsgiving enhance prayer mm. um then another insight that that you know might be surprising to folks who are protestant or who came up in the protestant world is um uh my number six my chapter six is called the truth about repetition because, this because is of, so important. Right. Okay. So, now we, we've only got two minutes left. So please get this. This is so important. Okay. So I, of course I came up in, 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 in a Protestant denomination where they said, 
Uh, it's bad to repeat prayers. You don't want to repeat your prayers. And turns out that that's not true. In fact, it's better to pray short prayers and repeat them over and over again than it is to pray long prayers that uh, are sort of dependent on eloquence and trying to say all the right things and you know cover all the bases. And the fact is, the fact is, Jim, if you if you're praying every day, you're, you're repeating yourself. You're just using different kinds of words. Well, of that that to me is vain repetition, if there's anything. But, but to pray these beautiful, beautiful prayers that have been given to us, yeah, it's a right. it's, you're and, being humble in that in that way. And you know, you mentioned that passage, vain repetition. That's uh, what is it, Matthew six seven or something like that. Um, and you get these translations that use the word repetition in there, but that's not in the Greek. If you check mm. the Greek on that passage, there is no vain repetition. Oh. In mm. that passage at all, Jesus mm. in that passage is criticizing people who go on and on with, with their many words, it says in Greek. So Jesus oh, is actually criticizing. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Thank Jesus you. is actually criticizing long extemporaneous prayer, not repeated prayer. Okay. So now, Jim, we're going to quit here. Okay. There's a set. We don't want it. What do they call that when you tell the end of a book? The spoiler. Uh -huh. Spoiler, yeah. So there's a seventh thing that we didn't get to. So what book do they need to get to to hear what it is? Uh, the book is Praying Like the Early Church, Seven Insights from the Church Fathers to Help You Connect with God. I think it's going to be everybody's favorite book. Every every household should have this. I'm so stoked. I get to I get my I get to get my copy pretty soon. Dr. Jim Papandrea, where can people find you? Uh, look for me on YouTube at the original church. This is Bear Wozniak. Uh, I have we have to we have to go uh, until next week. Oh, my wife likes me to make the sign of the cross in Hawaiian, and then we'll go. Okay, makua ke keki ame ke ohana hemalele in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. One of the early church prayers. Uh, until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you. Aloha. Thanks for listening to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Find more manly conversation at the Bear Wozniak Deep Adventure YouTube channel. Subscribe and ring the bell.